Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the distinguished lecture of electrical and computer engineering uh, today, the 15th of November, 2017. Uh, I am uh, greatly honored and uh, uh, very happy to have uh, John Stevenson here, uh, who is uh, the CTO, Chief Technology Officer of Stratasys Incorporated, the world's leader in 3D printing and additive manufacturing. As you all know, additive manufacturing is one of the hottest topics in engineering and the whole you know, manufacturing actually in, uh, in the world. And John is on the cutting edge of, ahead of everybody else. Prior to the acquisition by Astratasys, John was an uh, investor in an executive at GrabCAD changing how engineers work within almost four million registered members. GrabCAD is the world's largest and the fastest growing community of mechanical engineers and CAD professionals. And the reason I'm very excited and happy that John is here is because he is an alumni of the University of Delaware from mechanical engineering. John was at UD from fall 78 to a spring of 83. He has had a 30-year career as a software executive, primarily focused on software for manufacturing industry. He has been also executive vice president and PTC in Boston and the managing director of the Shape Data in Cambridge, England, and executive at Siemens PLM in California. He has had an extremely successful career in forming and uh, moving the startup companies. I, I believe that he has uh, three or four startup companies that he initiated. Besides the manufacturing, he has worked on many, many different companies. He has also been um, a founder and executive um, of um, Apple, uh, App IQ, uh, Blade Logic, and Veracode. The, the, these are all different web applications from storage to security and all relevant high tech stuff that we are all using. So currently, John is a member of the Board of Directors of the Dragon Innovation and Technology Advisor uh, to Vention. So it is my gr great pleasure to introduce uh, John Stevenson. Uh, thanks. Uh, as Mohsen mentioned, I'm a graduate of Delaware. Um, it's really my love of public speaking that led me to a career in software development in the first place. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. <laughs> so I'd, I'd like to keep this as casual as possible. So at the end of the talk, I understand there's a Q&A session. You should feel free to ask me anything you want. You know, having gone here and been an engineering student here, I sat in the same seat that you're sitting in. So I'd like you to take advantage of the opportunity to ask me anything, a professional, personal, whatever's on your mind. Um, today I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Stratasys. We're the world's largest 3D printing company. And walking around campus, I've noticed that you have a lot of our machines. You have them in the electrical engineering department, you have them in the mechanical engineering department, and even down on the STAR campus in the physical therapy department, using the machines for prototyping and uh, manufacturing parts. Uh, I came to Stratasys via the acquisition of GrabCAD, which, as Mosin mentioned, is the world's largest community for mechanical engineers. Uh, we started as a library for sharing CAD models, and there's a great professional need to share knowledge and CAD models themselves. And today we have 4 million registered members and we're growing at about 5,400 members per day. So it's still a very fast growing community of mechanical engineers. Um, so I'm here to talk about additive manufacturing and to give you a, sort of a behind the scenes view of what's going on in additive manufacturing and what you could expect to see in the next five or 10 years. So I'll talk about some of the problems we have and some of the challenges we're trying to overcome and some of the machines you can expect to see in the future. And we're working on a lot of stuff in our labs and some of the things I'll show you today and some of the things I can't show you. And I also know that all of our competitors are doing equally exciting things. So everything that you see today, multiply it by 10 and that's what you're really going to get from us and from every other 3D printing company. And I'll talk about what some of our 
competitors are doing as long as it's uh, public knowledge so you can know what's going on in other materials like metal and things like that. So uh, can we switch over to my computer? So this is something I taped from a TV show about two weeks ago. Uh, 3D printing is everywhere now. It's captured the public's imagination from uh, Obama mentioning 3D printing in the State of the Union address about uh, four years ago where he talked about 3D printing being the means to move manufacturing back to the United States uh, to uh, there being a 3D printer on the space station even. And of course, 3D printing shows up everywhere in TV and film. Things are amputation or death. Amputation is good news. People need time to adjust to big changes. Marco's family didn't even get a chance to pray for a miracle. It's not possible. The bone damage is too severe. A rod implantation won't work. There's nothing to anchor into. And the shed won't last long enough to do reconstruction. There are no other options. What if we could replace the entire... We're making him a new femur. That's a 3D printer. 3D printing boats have only successfully been done with men. We know. It's a fairly small boat. We know. He has to support the weight of the entire body. This one will be titanium. It can work. It's an interesting idea. I need to think on it. Right now, we still got seven yellow tags waiting. What do you have to think about? It's a good idea. It's a brilliant idea. Okay, so it's a brilliant idea. But I, I can promise that actually isn't happening in hospitals today. People aren't printing uh, prosthetics to order in the hospital, but we're getting very close. Uh, companies like Johnson & Johnson are 3D printing metal prosthetics, things like uh, knee replacements and hip replacements, but they're doing it in a factory up in Massachusetts. They're not doing it in the hospital. But we have lots of uh, hospitals that are customers that are using 3D printers for other uh, purposes. So 3D printing's captured the public's imagination, but what you see on TV and in the movies is a little bit ahead of what's actually happening. <coughs> okay, so let me talk about the future of additive manufacturing. I'm going to talk about uh, what is 3D printing? What are the different technologies that are available today? Uh, how is it used in manufacturing? And then I'll talk about the limitations of current technologies and the kind of challenges we have to overcome to realize the full potential of additive manufacturing. I'm most excited about that part of the presentation because I'm hoping that some of you will decide to make a career in manufacturing and additive manufacturing and will help to solve some of these problems. So what is 3D printing? 3D printing is simply the process of creating a physical object from layers of 2D computer data, whether the 2D layers are pictures, things like bitmaps, or simple polygons. So it's taking computer data and using it to create a physical object without first creating tooling, things like molds or uh, dyes or uh, cast forms. So how many people have seen a 3D printer in action? Almost everybody. How many people have used a 3D printer? Okay, pretty good, almost everybody. So 3D printing was invented uh, in the 1980s, around 1984, and uh, several different inventors invented different approaches to 3D printing around the same time. It started uh, in California with stereolithography, creating 3D objects from vats of photopolymers. And then there was a fellow in Minnesota who invented what's now called FDM, which is a, a material extrusion technique uh, to create 3D objects. So around the same time, a lot of different approaches were invented. And 3D printing was invented as a quicker way to create 3D objects without the expensive and time-consuming step of making tooling. So the first market for 3D printing was prototyping, and some people call it 3D printing, some people call it stereolithography, and some folks 
refer to it as rapid prototyping because that was the most common use case for 3D printing. And, and as I mentioned, many different technologies have been explored for 3D printing. Uh, with the expiration of patents, we've seen an explosion in 3D printers, especially low-end 3D printers. From its invention in 1984 until 2011, only about 45,000 3D printers were sold in total across the entire industry. But in 2012, 45,000 printers were sold, and that's because of the low-end maker printers that you could assemble yourself. And then today, about 300,000 printers are sold per year, and that's a mix of high-end industrial printers and low-end maker printers. So high-end 3D printing has found a home in manufacturing, not just in prototyping, but indirect manufacturing and even low count production uh, models. And high-end 3D printers are also finding applications outside of manufacturing, uh, for example, in healthcare, making prosthetics. So today there are seven fundamental forms of 3D printing. Do you know why there are seven? because that's how many have been invented so far. It doesn't mean that's all there's ever going to be. Uh, perhaps one of you will go home and invent a different way to create a 3D object from computer data, and hopefully you will, and you can invent a faster approach or approach that uh, can print a wider variety of materials or simply a cheaper approach. But today there are seven, seven fundamental kinds of 3D printers. So the first is binder jetting, and this is where a binder adhesive is sprayed onto a bed of powder, solidifying a layer, and then additional powder is added, another thin layer of powder, binder adhesive is sprayed onto that uh, layer of powder, and that process is repeated until you have a 3D object. So you can think about that as spraying super glue onto sand. And that can be used to make forms for uh, casting, for aluminum cast parts, for example, or to even make metal parts directly. Uh, there's a company up in Massachusetts called Desktop Metal, and they just raised over $200 million from venture capitalists to make metal printers that are office friendly and much faster than what's on the market today. And one of the approaches they're pursuing is binder jetting, where they're spraying an adhesive onto metal powder and then post-processing the part by baking it to remove the adhesive. Uh, the second approach is material jetting. That's uh, one of the types of printers that Stratasys sells. And this is where a polymer, uh, a photosensitive polymer, is jetted out of standard print heads, the kind you have on your printer at home, and then subject to UV light to cure the material. And I saw a couple of those printers on campus today. Uh, the third is vat photopolymerization, and this is where a vat of liquid photopolymer is subject to UV light, either from a laser or a projector, and solidified, and sometimes this is called stereolithography. Uh, how many people have heard of Form Labs? It, that's the kind of printer they make. It, they're sort of a low-cost printer, but very high-quality parts and surface finish. Uh, the next is called powder bed fusion, and this is where a bed of powder is subject to an energy source, usually a laser, so that the powder is solidified and then uh, repeated layer by layer until you have a solid part. This is the most popular form of metal printer today. So you can use powder bed fusion to make complex plastic parts, but you can also use it to make metal parts. Uh, next is directed energy deposition. This is sort of like welding, where you move material and an energy source together through 3D, and the material can be powder, or it can be a wire or a rod, and then the energy source is uh, sort of like a MIG torch. And this is used to repair metal parts, uh, for example, uh, turbine blades. Um, so it's sort of like sculpting in 3D. Next is material extrusion. Most of the printers you see are of this type. It's called FDM, typically, which is fused deposition modeling. And it's like a glue gun on the end of a, a gantry. So most of the low-end printers, the MakerBots and Ultimakers, are FDM printers. And a lot of the high-end printers, like the ones in the electrical engineering department and the mechanical engineering department, are of this type. So, this was actually invented by a friend of mine, Scott Crump, 
And this is a picture of him in his garage in 1988 when he invented this technology. And he used it to make toys for his uh, two-year-old. And he's a serial entrepreneur, and this was simply one of his inventions. So he stuck a glue gun to a 2D pen plotter and then used traditional toolpath generation software from Camax to drive it and prove that he could make parts. And then he went and founded what is now Stratasys based on this technology. So he doesn't look like that anymore. This is about 30 years ago, but uh, that was him in his garage. And FDM is used to make very complex parts and it's used frequently in manufacturing. There are a lot of aircraft from Boeing and Airbus that have FDM parts on them and hundreds of different FDM parts. And the final technique is sheet lamination. This is where sheets are cut out either from paper or plastic and glued together sequentially to create a 3D object. So why is all of this so exciting? Well, people have been making things probably since the first guy woke up with an opposable thumb. And about three and a half, four million years ago, hominids were making tools and weapons by uh, whittling branches to make spears or chipping away at stones to make cutting tools or arrowheads. So we've been making things forever. Then about 3,000 years ago, the Egyptians started to manipulate metal by heating it and pounding it and uh, quenching it by sticking it in a cold liquid to induce a phase change to make art or to make weapons like uh, swords or shields. And over the last 200 years, perhaps, we've seen more advancements in manufacturing than the previous four million years. In uh, the late 1700s, around 1798, Eli Whitney came up with the idea of interchangeable parts, and he used that to make muskets cheaper. He would make all of the triggers and all of the hammers, and he would make them in batches and then assemble muskets. So he invented the idea of making parts to tolerance so that you could assemble them from uh, inventory of parts. Then in um, the mid-1800s, we had the Industrial Revolution where we started to harness steam power to mechanize common tasks, which allowed mass production. In the early 1900s, Henry Ford invented the assembly line so we could produce parts cheaper, so they were more economical to manufacture and everybody could have them. And in the 1960s, we invented computer-aided design and manufacturing. That came out of the aerospace companies. The idea of designing things on a computer, then generating machine code and driving things like mills and lathes and cutting machines to generate physical objects. And additive manufacturing is the next big invention, creating things by adding material sequentially, manipulating material, inducing a phase change, and then adding it to an existing object to create a 3D object. But every time a new manufacturing te technique is invented, it has the potential to change the way we live. And we even have named some of the, the periods of our existence after these manufacturing breakthroughs, things like the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Industrial Revolution. And additive manufacturing has captured everybody's imagination because it has that kind of potential. So it has the potential to change the way we make things, which will affect all of us. So here are the fundamental business benefits of 3D printing. And in the future, we can probably imagine additional benefits. So I'm going to talk about some of them. But from our point of view, the benefits are freedom of design. You can manufacture things that you couldn't manufacture before, shapes that were impossible to manufacture. You can produce better parts because of freedom of design. There's economic personalization, making parts for specific individuals based on their tastes or their anatomies. Uh, low volume manufacturing, manufacturing lower counts of items because you don't have to make expensive tooling. You can streamline the supply chain, move manufacturing local to the consumer rather than doing it remotely in a cheaper location. And life cycle sustainability, making parts that are friendlier to our environment because they use less material. So the one that's most exciting to me is freedom of design. Because 3D printing is additive, complexity is almost free. You can create a shape and the cost of manufacturing that shape is really dependent on the amount of material you're using and almost independent of geometry. 
So you can even print objects inside of objects, which would be impossible to manufacture with traditional techniques. So geometry is free. So that opens up all kinds of applications that weren't possible with traditional manufacturing. For example, microfluidics, where you can create very small, complex channel structures. You can create uh, internal channels that are very small, so that they're so small they can induce a capillary effect. You can create lattices that are very complex and would be uh, virtually impossible to make with any other approach. And using those techniques, you could steer uh, liquid absorption, for example. And you can create functional lattices. You can design lattices that are light yet strong through things like topology optimization. Or you can create lattices that behave differently under different loads. They fail or break in different predictable ways. So freedom of design is extremely exciting to me because having been in the CAD industry for 30 years, now we can explore shapes that you simply couldn't make before, even if you could imagine them. Uh, because of freedom of design, you can create better parts, parts with complex geometries that are better at dissipating heat, or complex geometries that are better at absorbing energy, so you can make safer products. Uh, a real life example is a hip implant. When I started in CAD in the 1980s, about four different companies made prosthetics, hip implants and artificial knees. And they only made them in a limited number of sizes. I think it was about half a dozen. Because it's an FDA regulated industry, uh, because of advancements in manufacturing and design, however, the regulations have changed. And now models can be printed to size. So uh, the implant can fit an individual exactly. And not only that, not only does the implant fit better, but the geometry of the surfaces that meet with existing bone, where bone is expected to grow over the prosthetic, can be more complex, encouraging bone growth. So the performance is better. So being able to create better products, products with better performance, because of freedom of design is going to create a step change in the way we design things. So the things that you see in your lifetime are going to look different than the parts that we've been making for the last 50 years. They're going to look cosmetically different. People will use topology optimization software to create parts that are both lighter and stronger because you can manufacture them, and they're simply going to look different. The design signatures will be new. Another advantage is economic personalization. Because you don't have to create tooling and you can create parts one at a time, you can create parts that fit individuals, uh, whether it's prosthetics or orthotics or even uh, fashion items like glasses. So we have customers, hospitals, that use our 3D printers to print models for surgical training and surgical planning. So, we can print bones that look and feel like real human bones. And surgeons use them to train because as you drill through the bone, you'll uh, meet the same type of resistance that you would when you're drilling into a real bone if you're testing or learning how to use a medical device. So you'll have hard resistance until the drill head breaks through the bone and then the drill will advance. And surgeons need that type of training because when you're doing it in real life, you want to know what it's going to feel like. And a lot of time these surgeries are done somewhat blind because it's not as simple as having a bone on a table. There's a lot more involved, including blood and flesh. So they want to practice these surgeries before they have to do them. But even more exciting is we're able to print MRI data and CAT scan data. So surgeons can print an individual's anatomy with their specific pathology, whether it's a tumor, or a malformed bone and practice the surgery the day before they actually have to perform it, which radically increases their chance of success. And sometimes it even gives them an idea about performing a different surgery or a different treatment entirely, which could be safer or yield better results. So that's enabled by printing individual anatomies from MRI data. And of course, uh, custom orthotics, where you're uh, 
putting uh, a plastic part either in somebody's shoe or using it as a walking boot, those parts can be made exactly to fit uh, an individual, giving better results. Uh, another advantage of 3D printing is uh, low count manufacturing. Uh, tooling's expensive. If I want to make a part out of plastic, I can do it by blow molding or injection molding. But to do it with injection molding, I have to cut a metal mold, and that's an expensive process. And it doesn't always work the first time. Uh, cutting a mold usually takes about six weeks, and it costs maybe $40,000, maybe $80,000. If I'm only making one of something, that's impractical. But with 3D printing, you can make one of something. Here's an example from Bentley, which is a high-end uh, automotive company. They had a customer with mobility issues that needed a customized dashboard with a different geometry. Uh, Bentley has in-house metal and uh, plastic printing capabilities. So in this case, uh, normally these parts are uh, used or are made with reactive injection molding, with, which is an expensive process. In this case, they printed a metal part and then covered it with leather and wood to create a custom automobile. And they were able to do this in a matter of weeks at low cost. Uh, 3D printing enables streamlined supply chains. In the example on the upper right, this is from a company in Manhattan that prints earbuds or uh, headphones that fit individuals' ears exactly. So they take a picture to scale of the shape of somebody's ear, and then they print the plastic part of the earbud, and you come and pick it up the next day. So uh, it feels better, and the sound quality is better. So by streamlined supply chain, I mean manufacturing <laughs> local to the customer, moving raw material, and the means of manufacturing as close to the customer as possible, rather than printing parts and shipping them to the consumer. An extreme example is the 3D printer on the space station. Uh, you probably read about this in uh, local media. And here, the space station has a 3D printer and they printed a plastic wrench when they needed to make a repair. So the way this would work is the design of the tool would happen on Earth, the CAD data or the tool paths would be sent to the space station and they would print the parts they need. So since they don't know what tools they need in advance, all they need to do is have a 3D printer and filament on board and then they can make the tool that they need. So how is 3D printing used in manufacturing today? Well, it's used three ways. Uh, prototyping, it's used in uh, indirect manufacturing, creating tooling or jigs and fixtures or assembly aids, and it's used in uh, low count uh, production uh, part creation. So in prototyping, people use 3D printing to test form, fit, and function. Uh, we now have 3D printers that can print in full color. They can print eight materials at a time. So you can print virtually the entire color gamut. And you can even print a different material voxel by voxel so that you can engineer your own digital materials that behave differently uh, to stress or loads in one part of the geometry versus another. Uh, they use it to test fit and they use it to test function and performance. In indirect, well, here's an, another example of prototyping. Uh, the Air Force Academy uses 3D printing to create wind tunnel models, and they can do that in two weeks for $10,000 versus creating a physical model uh, with traditional techniques, which would take much longer. In indirect manufacturing, Navair uses 3D printing to create tooling on board a ship. So, Rather than having a machine shop to create every metal tool that they need, they simply print a plastic tool and use it as a form to create metal parts. Uh, Rockwest uses tooling to create the layups for composites, which are then uh, laid up by hand. And Penske uh, uses it to create the sacrificial tooling for composite parts for their race cars. In indirect manufacturing, you can use plastic printing for virtually anything that you create metal tools with today. And the plastic tooling won't last as long as a metal tool, but the difference is you can have it within 24 hours. So people use plastic tools for blow molding, injection molding, uh, sacrificial tooling, sintering, and assembly aids, almost everything. 
In direct manufacturing, people use 3D printing to create low count production parts, but they can make better parts. For example, GE in their LEAP engine initiative was able to create a nozzle with more complex geometry, achieving better dispersion of the liquid that was forced through the nozzle. And because of that, they achieved 15% fuel savings, which is huge for an engine. At Delphi, which makes diesel pumps, was able to take a pump that was manufactured with multiple manufacturing steps, casting, drilling, uh, finishing, and machining, and instead designed the pump around their design requirements, around the intake and exit holes, and create a pump with one manufacturing step. This is one of the most popular uh, uses for manufacturing of direct parts. You can create parts that have, or assemblies that have maybe six parts where you would have had 80 parts before. And that's because the geometries can be more complex. And that allows you to produce better performing parts, parts that are easier to assemble, and uh, parts that are more economical. So first let me talk about some of the machines you can expect to see that are going to overcome some of these challenges. And I'll show you some of the ones that have already been disclosed publicly and not all the ones that haven't been disclosed. And then I'll talk about some of the specific engineering challenges that still remain that we're working on and that I hope you're working on. So first, today, most 3D printers that you see are generic. They print plastics or they print metal, but they're made for any application, for prototyping or uh, indirect manufacturing or manufacturing. In the future, you're going to see 3D printers that are made for very specific applications. And by doing that, you can overcome some of the part size limitations and some of the economic limitations. By creating a printer that's specific to a specific application, it will perform better because it's not general purpose. And I actually saw quite a lot of that in Mark's lab today over at the EE department. They're investigating technologies for specific purposes. And that's the future of additive manufacturing, machines that each have a specific purpose. And if you walk through any factory today, through 3M or uh, through General Motors or Boeing, you're going to see a lot of manufacturing machines that are made uh, to make specific parts, and they do it at high speed. So traditional manufacturing already has machines that are purpose-built. You're going to see that in additive manufacturing. Uh, the second is you'll see machines that print multiple materials that have different properties and behave differently in different environments. We already have printers like the material extrusion printers and the material jetting printers that can print in multiple materials, up to eight materials. But by increasing material variety, you can print parts for specific applications because of the material properties. You'll see printers sold as arrays of printers, overcoming some of the speed and economic issues. So jobs will come in in batch. I need 10,000 of this and 5,000 of that. And they'll be sent to an array of printers, automatically ejected and shipped. Uh, so the supply chain itself and the delivery mechanism are also automated. And this will make printing more competitive with, with traditional techniques like injection molding for higher part counts. Uh, you'll see infinite build printers, print, printers that are infinite in one direction. We've built several of these, and they're already in use at companies like Ford and Boeing to print very large parts, uh, like aircraft wings. So the printer is turned on its side, and then the part is ejected along uh, the x-axis, and it's on a roller, so you can print a part as long as you want. And there are a lot of technology challenges in making this printer, being able to print accurately for large parts, and being able to feed the material continuously because uh, these print jobs can take weeks. So the infinite build printer is already in production, and you're going to see a lot of this in manufacturing in the future. And finally, the printer that I spend most of my time on is the multi-axis printer. Uh, we, sometimes we call that conformal printing. So this printer is a robot printing composite material onto a part that itself sits on a bed that can be moved in three axis. So this is an eight axis printer. And the reason this is so exciting 
is that you can lay the fibers or the toolpath directions the way you want to influence uh, part performance. By laying out the composite fibers in certain directions, you can improve strength in one direction versus another. So you can create lighter, stronger parts. So this is true 3D printing. If you look at printing today, it's really 2D or 1D printing because you're laying out material in a line. This is creating 3D objects. And I saw some of that in Mark's lab today as well. This also overcomes some of the part size limitations by printing with a robot and having a sequence of robots on an assembly line. Uh, the way it will work is the robots will be stationary and the parts will move along a rail. You can print printers of literally infinite size. So as an aside, why are composites so exciting? Um, you might not know this, but the University of Delaware is known as the hotbed for composite material research. Uh, the Center for Composite Materials was founded here in 1974 by Dr. Vincent, uh, Dr. Chu, and Dr. Pipes. And they did a lot of research on uh, the material properties of composite materials and what you could do with composite materials. And that center is still going strong today uh, 40 years later. So the University of Delaware is the hotbed of composite material research. Uh, composites are exciting because you can create stronger, lighter parts. That's why composites uh, are so exciting. But with 3D printing, because of freedom of geometry, you can create even stronger, even lighter parts. You can create parts with uh, optimized topologies. And with uh, 3D printing, controlling the layout of the composite with a robot or a multi-axis machine tool, you can lay the fibers out in any direction in an economical way, faster and cheaper than hand layup. So what are some of the remaining engineering challenges? First, it takes almost every engineering discipline to make a 3D printer. It's a complex machine. Like any complex machine, you have typical machine design challenges. You have to worry about things like vibration analysis, making sure you don't move the parts at such a velocity or acceleration that you induce a natural frequency. You have to worry about control software. Uh, you have to worry about cost of goods, everything that you worry about when you make any other machine. But additionally, because you're processing material and inducing a phase change, as you process the material, deposit it, and then the material cools, you have a lot of other issues like material science, uh, how do you get the proper phase change, uh, chemistry, how do I make the materials in an economic way because you want to make money, uh, fluid dynamics. People probably don't think about 3D printing and fluid dynamics together, but as I'm extruding a filament through a nozzle, that nozzle is moving at variable speed because I want to print as fast as possible without inducing natural frequencies, which means I have to melt the filament and push the filament through the nozzle at a variable rate. So I have to figure out what temperatures to melt the filament at and what pressure to apply to the filament so I'm moving uh, the filament up and down through the nozzle so that I get the right results. And it's all done in real time, and it has to be extremely accurate if I'm going to end up with a high quality part. So we have a lot of people thinking about fluid dynamics and the uh, uh, math behind the transfer function of filament to uh, liquid. And most of this is done today through experimentation and empirical results, but we're trying to get uh, as scientific as possible so that we can print at higher speeds. And of course, there's a differential geometry problem. When people look at the uh, robotic printer, the conformal printer, it looks pretty simple. I'm just laying a filament on a 3D object, but that's actually a very complex math problem. And the reason it's complex is that I want to print uh, the fiber in the right direction based on the uh, results of perhaps a structural analysis. So I have to create the appropriate 3D toolpath, but I also want to print as fast as possible. I want to print with as little support material as possible to reduce the post-processing time. And I want to be able to print without collision, which is the hardest part. And I also want to print in the appropriate sequence because the part after it's been printed is cooling and you want to print when the temperature is still high enough to, so that uh, the filament adheres to the existing part. But the collision part is the hardest part. 
I need to sequence the toolpaths so the nozzle doesn't collide with any of the existing features of the part, and the robot doesn't collide with the features of the part. So it's a very challenging 3D differential geometry problem. Make sense? Okay, so it looks simple, but it's actually a very exciting math problem. So, some other challenges that we're working on is cybersecurity. I know that Ken has started a cybersecurity initiative in the electrical engineering department. When you're 3D printing, the CAD model is the product because I don't have to create expensive tooling to uh, create a product and the materials are uh, easily purchasable. The CAD model itself is the product and that opens up new challenges for IP protection and security and people are exploring all different approaches to supply chain security and IP security. Uh, the next challenge is multi-axis printing. So I already talked about why that's hard. Uh, this is a video of uh, the robot printer in action. And you can see that the parts being moved and the robots being moved to lay the geometry out. But if you could imagine additional features on this uh, nose cone, for example, some bosses sticking out of the side or a plate so that it could be attached to an aircraft or a handle, then the sequencing of the toolpaths becomes much more challenging. And uh, simulation of manufactured parts is, is also a very difficult problem. So everything we've done in CAD over the last 30 years for traditional manufacturing, subtractive manufacturing, has to be redone for additive manufacturing. Uh, geometry creation, um, annotating the CAD model with all of the information necessary to manufacture the part, everything that the machine operator needs to know what he's supposed to do and simulation of the part. And there's two kinds of simulation. There's simulating the performance of a part, and then there's simulation the manufacturing process itself. So if I have a, an FDM part, a part that's made by extruding material, I can't use a traditional FEA uh, software package to analyze the performance of that part because there's simply too much data. Uh, the way the part is made is uh, one line at a time and there's uh, adhesion between the layers of the part. So modeling all of that, you could do it in an FEA program by modeling the part as a series of rods, but that model would be much larger than what the FEA programs were meant to analyze. So new approaches to performing structural analysis and vibration analysis and thermal analysis of 3D printed parts uh, needs to be invented, and people are working on that. We're working with Dassault Systems and their Simulia product to be able to analyze these parts. And the animation you see is the outcome of one of these research projects. Now, the second type of analysis, which is probably more pressing, is analyzing the manufacturing process itself. So if you look at injection molding, uh, there's a program called MoFlow that's been around since the 1970s, uh, invented and written in Australia, that simulates the injection molding process. Uh, you model the geometry of the mold, and you tell the software where the runners are, where the plastic's going to be injected, and under what pressure, and which materials, and where the cooling lines are. So you tell the software how the part is going to be cooled and it figures out whether or not the mold will be filled to completion. And when I take the plastic part out of the mold, whether or not it's going to warp based on the injection molding process and the cooling of the part. So that type of analysis is called manufacturing simulation. And similar uh, software exists for almost every manufacturing technique. Uh, sheet metal, for example, figuring out how much the sheet metal is going to stretch as I bend it or progressive die design, figuring out what shapes of dies I need so that I can move metal through uh, a sequence of geometries to end up with the part I want. That simulation doesn't exist for 3D printing today, but it's actually very important for 3D printing because the yield is low. As you're inducing a phase change in plastics or metal, the metal cools 
And then there's uh, residual stresses and strains in the final product. And in metal printing, the yield in metal printing today is very low. It's about 50%, which means about 50% of the time I'll get the part I want, and 50% of the time I won't. And that's because when I'm printing on metal, I'm printing onto a hot surface, and the weight increases as the part gets bigger, which will cause some compaction. And then when the part is cooled, you're going to have residual stresses and some deformation. So the solution to that is not just better hardware, but it's better software. So I can figure out a better sequence uh, for printing the part or how to add uh, support material that will uh, prevent warping or remove some of the residual stresses. And that's a very complex math problem, but somebody has to write the simulation software for that manufacturing technique. And finally, uh, writing CAD tools to design the geometries that can only be made with 3D printing. Uh, CAD today was designed for traditional manufacturing. You design the outside of an object, and then you generate the tool paths to remove material until you get the object you want. In 3D printing, I can, complete, I can create complex geometries, so you need better CAD tools to be able to model those larger, more complex geometries. But because I can also print multiple materials, and even materials that are different voxel by voxel, you need to be able to model the inside of a part. And the tools used in CAD today, BREP geometric modeling tools, are not suited for modeling the interior of a part. You can't model the interior of a part in a CAD system like SOLIDWORKS. You can only model the exterior, so new math needs to be invented to model the interior, and it won't be based on today's BREP geometric modeling engines. And the biggest challenge, of course, is materials. I need to be able to print in a wider variety of materials so I can produce a wider variety of products. Uh, materials like ceramics or uh, different kinds of metals or different plastics. So the real breakthrough in 3D printing will be inventing new 3D printers to print different kinds of materials. So if I was going to leave you with one thought, it would be that everything we've done over the last 30 years, 40 years in computer-aided design and manufacturing for today's manufacturing techniques has to be redone completely for additive manufacturing. Everything from geometric modeling to uh, manufacturing instruction generation, tool path creation, <coughs> manufacturing simulation, and uh, part performance simulation. So all of that is still on the table. So there's going to be a lot of work to make additive manufacturing a reality over the next 30 years. So now I'm going to open it up to questions. <laughs> oh, thanks. Hey, Chase. I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Um, recently, uh, my seniors have been designing the three printers for three or four years. And recently, a student came <laughs> and uh, built a really fine uh, pan tilt unit for a camera that was going to be doing open CV recognition. You know, okay. Camera pan tilt unit. And yeah. I said, really nice. What printer did you print on? Yep. So there was a lot of hype a few years ago about people having printers in their home to make replacement parts for things like when their refrigerator broke. I don't think that's the near-term future of having a manufacturing tool in your home. I think that's unrealistic because of some of the limitations I talked about, material selection. But I think having a 3D printer in your home for educational purposes is happening now. And it's an educational tool the same way that having a computer in your home was in 1982. 
Uh, people had computers in their home before DOS and before Windows. None of you guys were born yet, but they had uh, microprocessors in their home that they either assembled themselves or were from companies like Tandy in the very beginning. And it was an educational tool. It was to learn about computing. And that's how people like, just to tell a story, that's how people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs got started. They were building computers using microprocessors, which were new, but these computers were for hobbyists. And the clubs that got together and discussed the use of these computers were hobbyist clubs. And they were sold by electronics retailers like Radio Shack, and you had to assemble them yourself. So that was the start of home computing. PCs just didn't pop out fully formed with Microsoft Word on them. So you're seeing the same thing in printing. I fully agree with the educational. Okay, um, it's the modern equivalent of only you and I would know what this is—a vacuform, yeah. a tell vacuform or something. Yeah. Um, but again, what do you think? The we're talking about fifty percent middle middle uh, income households. Well, I think it will be a hundred percent of high schools. Okay. And people will use it in their uh, first robotics competitions. Right. I'm I'm talking about yeah. people who yeah. will invest the what will probably be a two hundred dollar item. Yeah. Like, or is yeah. it just I'd, gonna be in the schools? Okay, I would say it's going to be, if I was to guess, I, w I would like it to be 100% because we own MakerBot and that would be great. But I think it's more likely to be 50% of households that have kids interested in STEM and, and they'll go out and buy one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I check that out. Yeah. Um, where, where do you see uh, the future of additive manufacturing and construction? So that's not a market we're in, but I follow it the same way that you do through popular media and YouTube videos. And I've seen uh, parents print uh, playhouses in their backyard with 3D printers they invented. And I've seen people print houses out of cement. And I think that is going to happen because it's cheaper and it can, uh, be done with custom designs. So I think in some environments, it's going to be a cheaper way to make housing. But I don't think it's, it's going to have significant penetration in the traditional housing market, but I think you'll see some of it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming out to speak to us. And at the be beginning, you mentioned uh, the 3D printer on the space station, in, or the ISS. What is different about printing in microgravity? Is it harder or easier, and what are some of the other challenges? That, that's a good question. It, this is the first time that 3D printing has been used in microgravity, and I know we didn't do any experiments uh, prior to this. Um, I'm not sure how much of a challenge it will be because if you look at the nozzle of a 3D printer, it's extremely close to the part that's being printed on and the filament is being extruded under pressure. So I'm not sure gravity will have much of an effect at all on the quality of the finished part, but we haven't run any experiments ourselves to determine that. Uh, for other techniques though, like the material jetting where you're spraying out of a nozzle, perhaps that wouldn't work at all in a non-gravity situation. But with filament extrusion, the distance between the nozzle and the part is extremely small. So this may be a lot more of a loaded question than I intend, but uh, so you, you had mentioned that you can print up to eight materials at once. What's actually preventing you from doing nine, 10, or so on? Well, well we couldn't get it to work. That was the problem. <laughs> so, so um, if you look at the eight material printer, it's really six materials plus transparent plus support material. And all we did was put m multiple printer heads on uh, the transom. And there's nothing to prevent us from sticking eight more heads and doing more materials. Um, the reason we were focused on the number of heads we were is so that we could have um, a big percent of the color gamut. And uh, because you have to mix a lot of colors to get the vivid colors that you want. But if you're printing in multiple, multiple materials for part performance, then you're gonna want even more materials. And there's, there's no technology challenge in that. It's really a cost of goods issue. 
So you know, the printers become more expensive as you stick more print heads on them. So it can be done. That's for the material jetting printers. For the printers where you have nozzles moving around, then you really have a space problem. It's, it's more of a physical problem. But for the, the print heads, you're just moving the print heads across the part. So you can have as many as you want. Motion. So you mentioned the bio biology and the yeah. you know, living tissue printers. There's in yes. the newer slides, but yeah. there's a lot going on there. Can you make some comments about that as well? What yeah. do you see the future of that? Yeah, so there, there are a few interesting things going on in printing uh, living materials. So first let me talk about the parts I showed. These are polymer parts that look and feel like uh, real uh, anatomies, bones, ligaments, and even tissue, but they're made out of plastic. And we make plastics that look and feel real through chemistry. Uh, however, the, the second part of the problem for us was being able to model the interior of the part because you can't model the interior of the bone using a tool like SolidWorks. And the data that you have coming in is data from an MRI scan, which is simply a cloud of data. So it has to be interpreted and then mapped to the different parts of a bone, the trabecular structure. So we invented our own math based on distance fields to be able to model the interiors of the parts. And that's part of our secret sauce. Um, the second part of the question is, what about printing organic materials or tissues or organs? I think that it is going to be a reality and you'll be able to print organic structures uh, like artificial livers and that will happen in our lifetime. Yes. You're dealing with highly flexible things that go through complex topologies post manufacturing when you put it in different media and so on. So we have customers. So the question was what about 4D printing? Printing where the topology of the part changes based on environment after production. So we have customers today that print living hinges. So the part is rigid in some areas and flexible in others so that you have a single physical object that acts as a hinge. And you see that in consumer goods today. And um, we also have customers, because we have multiple materials, can print things that simulate over molding. So the part will feel rubbery in one area and hard in another. And so they take advantage of that. Um, I'm not aware of any customers that are printing parts where the topology changes due to time or due to exposure to an environmental condition. But I've seen a lot of research on that at MIT, where they're printing an object and then the object unfolds or folds. And sometimes they're doing research because they want that physical model, and sometimes they're simulating something like a protein folding. And they're trying to figure out why protein folds the way it does. And you could probably do that with our multi-material polymer printers. I'm not aware of anyone myself that's doing that. Um, are there any laws or regulations that your experience have particularly fostered this industry? Or um, are there any laws or regulations that you think are particularly hindering this industry um, Well, we have all of the normal regulatory compliance issues of any hardware manufacturer, which are different country to country. And uh, so those are well understood. Um, I'm not aware of any laws that are hindering the industry, but there are certainly a lot of patent issues that are slowing down the industry because it's a very competitive environment with a lot of influx of capital, both from big companies and from venture capitalists. So the protection of IP is very important in this industry. And it, as in any other high growth industry, that uh, tends to dampen growth. Um, we do have customers that have IP concerns because they're having parts manufactured using 3D printing and they're outsourcing that. And they wanna know that their IP is not being stolen. So that's an issue that we're trying to deal with now. How do I secure the supply chain, given that the digital model is uh, the part? And we're looking at different techniques of doing that based on uh, securing the data itself.
Yes, so um, I'm not the expert in this area, but we are subject to regulatory compliance because of the materials we process and the nature of the materials, uh, both in the environment in which they're being operated in and then the disposal of the materials afterwards. And those regulations differ even state to state. So those are all issues that we have to worry about so that our customers can buy and use our printers. So we're subject to the, the same uh, environmental requirements when you install the printer. It has to be vented, it has to be in a certain area, the material has to be handled in a specific way and disposed of in a specific way. And, and they're really country specific. So I know as a big manufacturer, those are issues that we're capable of dealing with and have been dealing with for 20 years. I'm not sure about all of the new printing companies that are printing in different materials, if, if uh, they've addressed those issues or even have the wherewithal to address those issues, because there are a lot of 3D printing companies now starting up. Right, right here. Ah, sorry. <laughs> um, are we able to print complex circuitry and components um, that have the same properties, or would there be variations? I think Mark probably knows better than I do because he's working on uh, application-specific printers here at Delaware, which was one of the most exciting things I saw. Uh, we make uh, printers for uh, general purpose printers for plastic, the, the two different kinds, and we're enabling things like pick and place or secondary operations. And we know customers are embedding circuits in our parts uh, halfway through the process. Uh, but I think the future of printing is application-specific printers for printing things like uh, actuators and batteries and antennas. Yo. 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 What kind of uh, economic impact uh, do you see coming about, like in terms of um, a job um, marketplace? Because uh, I can, I would think that um, 3D printing us uses a lot less manpower. So, in terms of like, I'm, I'm curious about like on a country level, like, like the U.S. Um, you know, unemployment rate, what that might look like in a few years because of this. Yeah, so I actually think it's going to create a lot of jobs because money is flowing in to manufacturing again for research and uh, creating different types of machines for different applications. So I don't worry about things like the manpower in operating the machines, although I think it will create jobs there because the machines are operated differently than traditional machines. But in terms of doing the scientific research and the engineering research to advance this technology, it's creating a lot of jobs. And, and just to give you some data, in Boston, just in Boston alone, um, Desktop Metal, which is a two-year-old startup in Boston, raised over $200 million from venture capitalists to produce their metal printers. Uh, Mark Forged, which makes printers for printing composite materials, raised over $20 million earlier this year. Uh, Form Labs, which makes the stereo lithography printers, raised money this year. So there's a lot of investment flowing into the industry. And, and that's just three that are in my neighborhood. I, I know there's a bunch of others in Boston, too. And that's just Boston. So I think it's going to create a lot of jobs. So today in metal, you see most of the printers are uh, select laser sintering, where you're applying a laser to a powder bed. And um, now, though, you're seeing uh, companies like Desktop Metal 
who are producing printers using binder jetting. So you're uh, spraying an adhesive on a powder bed and then post-processing, sticking the part in an autoclave to remove the adhesive and extruding a mix of metal and polymer through a nozzle and then again post-processing the part. And the belief is, at least with the binder jetting approach, that they'll be able to print any uh, metal that's used in metal injection molding, which is a very uh, wide array of powdered metals, and that they'll be able to get higher quality parts faster than you can with uh, current technologies, and that the results will be competitive or better than metal injection molding. So that's the claim, and we'll find out in the next year or two where it goes. Does that answer the question? I'm just okay. wondering whether the direct metal acquisition will be better. Well, I think it will. It's very early days for metal. So the metal 3D printing industry is growing at about 100% per year right now, and it has for the last three years. And it's because the technology is so new. And it's so new that the yield is still very low. The machines are not great yet. The results are not great. And I think they're going to improve in two ways, through new inventions, uh, for example, printing green metal and post-processing it. And, and there's a lot more going on there uh, than I've mentioned. And through math, being able to simulate the process to get better results. So I would say that it's very early days for metal 3D printing. There's a lot of money flowing into that research. and. I think that, uh, you know, I personally am bullish on what we're going to see. Uh, you mentioned the uh, future IP concerns for uh, 3D models, um, but the, the current uh, culture in uh, 3D printing is, is more kind of open. I mean, your own company, GrabCAD, uh, kind of encourages sharing between engineers. Do you see the, uh, the market moving more towards uh, like encrypted files or locked, le legally locked um, intellectual yeah, property? Yeah, I, I think for manufacturing, you're going to see a securing of the supply chain by securing the data itself. Uh, for example, there's a company in Germany called 3D Trust, which is being incubated by Airbus. And, there, and Airbus makes metal parts and plastic parts using 3D printing. They use our printers to make plastic parts but the actual printing is done by a third party, so that's called a service bureau. So they're concerned about what happens to the data when they send it to them. Could they be printing more parts than they're told to, or could the data leak somehow? So 3D Trust is a software startup, and they're securing the data on site at the service bureau in an encrypted way, and then creating a secure path between the vault of encrypted data and the printer itself so that you know where the data is and it's only decrypted as close to the actual printing operation as possible. And so all of that happens on a LAN, uh, in a secure environment, offline. And that's just one approach. You know, others are doing things like putting data in the toolpath so that you can tell if a part is counterfeit or not by uh, looking at the physical part, you know, somehow uh, sticking uh, data like a watermark in the physical part, or putting a serial number on every part that's automatically generated at print time. So people are investigating all different approaches for IP protection, and I, I think there'll be multiple solutions to this. Yeah, you mentioned uh, the topological optimization um, of the 3D printing process, and. Uh, the advancements in software that are going to have to happen. Is Stratasys looking at uh, um, uh, acquiring the software proprietarily? Um, or are you guys more akin to uh, open source type of? Yeah, well, we'll see who the winners are in topology optimization. So um, today, a lot of people are fooling around with topology optimization to create better parts, and we want all of them to succeed because it's good for us. It means people are making parts that can only be manufactured through printing. Uh, I would say the current players are uh, Altair, which is an, a very big services and software company in Michigan that's been doing topology optimization for 
maybe 30 years. And now with 3D printing, that software has found a real application. And a lot of customers use that in automotive and aerospace. And then there are a couple of startups like Frustum, which is making a topology optimization kernel, and N Topology in New York, which is writing software for automated lattice generation. So I, I think there'll be multiple winners in topology optimization, and you know, I hope that they're all successful. Um, realistically, how long do you think it will take for companies to transition over to this type of manufacturing fully? And also, what percentage of the industry is already ready, already using this type of manufacturing? Um, so, today, so the, today, 3D printed parts are used on aircraft that you fly in already from Airbus and Boeing. And they're trying to advance the technology as much as possible because it saves them money. Every time you take a pound off of an airplane, it saves hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of the aircraft in fuel costs. So they're doing their own research and they're uh, trying to push us so that they can adopt 3D printing. So at the high end in aerospace, they're driving adoption themselves. And automotive, they use 3D printing in indirect manufacturing quite a lot but they're experimenting with 3D printing to create uh, customized vehicles. And so I think it's happening at the high end already. You know, for consumer products where you're making uh, large count uh, models, it's going to be uh, slower to happen. It'll happen in tooling, but less in direct manufacturing for now until we have technologies that are more competitive. But next time you're on a, a Boeing airplane, look around and see if you can find FDM parts. Um, for the uh, true 3D printing that you mentioned before, did you guys have to develop like your own program to be able to program the paths for that, since there's like yes. two different parts moving around? And how long did it usually take someone to be able to develop the pathways to make that work? OK, good question. So. Um, let me just talk about the FDM technologies first. So what Scott did when he invented the sticking a glue gun on a 2D pen plotter was he used software from Camax, which was a small uh, traditional toolpath generation software company in Cincinnati. And he reverse engineered it a little bit to create the toolpaths he used. Then over the next 15 years in Minnesota, they wrote their own toolpath generation software and it wasn't that hard because all you're doing is filling up a 2D polygon, which is a multiply connected uh, polygon with a toolpath, which isn't that difficult of a math problem. Um, I will say though that the toolpath isn't as simple as that because in order to create uh, high quality parts with good surface finish or good infill, the toolpath will be dense in some areas and sparse, sparse in others. And that's sort of a trade secret how we do that. So the toolpath is modified a little bit. So on the FDM side, it wasn't that hard, but there is some secret sauce in our toolpath that makes our parts better. On the material jetting side, you're really processing bitmaps. And that's a different problem because you're dealing with high volumes of data. Uh, but again, not that challenging a math problem. Where the challenging problems have come in more recently is being able to model the interior of parts in a way that mimics uh, real life or the performance that you want, and you need new math to do that, and we're working on that, and uh, we've been pretty successful there. And then the second part is creating the conformal toolpaths, which are the multi-axis toolpaths. Now that part is very hard, and that's a really challenging problem. So I don't know how long it's going to take. I know how long the marketing department thinks it's going to take. <laughs> so but we'll find out how long it really takes. All right. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to thank uh, John for taking time today to come to the University of Delaware and giving this excellent talk. Oh, thanks, Mr. Thank you. Um, no, just, uh, just so, yeah, the honor was mine, uh, actually, thank so you. thank you. And uh, also so. one, thing, one announcement before we close today, um, John mentioned a couple of times in his talk about uh, Mark, this is Dr. Mark Moraznik, 
who is spearheading what we are initiating as an institute of um, additive manufacturing at the University of Delaware, and co-located with another entity which is called the Maker Space. This uh, will be uh, initiating starting next fall. There will be a lot of uh, excellent and uh, exciting news that we will hear from the community inside the university. So uh, we are, again, uh, extremely happy that John came here. And as an alumnus, uh, alumnus of the university, will be helping us to see the vision for the future of this exciting area. So thank you very much for coming, and hopefully we'll see you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.